to our next presentation, uh, developing development. We've got another tag team presentation here. This group is Wally Deschamps, Bob Benha, and Nick Clemens, or as we well, apparently he prefers to be called Kid Clamp. So uh, they are going to go ahead and start with their presentation. So take it away, guys. Oh. I realized Bob was making a group for me. I thought he was going to take the microphone. Um, so I'm Nick Clemens. I'm one of the Bywater developers at Bywater. Um, I've been working on Koha for a while now. <laughs> um, do you guys want to introduce yourself? Yeah, just a little bit. Okay, this is Bob Benhoff. He is the Koha US Vice President. So you probably all communicated with him and sent him your slides, hopefully, if you have presentations coming up. Um, and works at the Colorado Library Consortium as the Ask the Cat Manager. Uh, this is Wally from the Prosper Community Library, the Technical Services Coordinator. He says he's an average Koha user, um, but I think he's a little more than that. <laughs> and a frequent ticket submitter. Um, so what we're gonna talk about three kind of main things today um, about Koha developments. First, just kind of an overview of what is development. That's gonna be me talking, so enjoy that part. part. Uh, then eventually you'll get to the real content. You'll get Bob talking about how does Koha US contribute to developments? How do they initiate and support them? And then Wally's going to tell us what you can do to contribute, um, how the average user can be involved other ways than coding. Um, so if you want to code, you're welcome to, and I'm happy to help anyone on that path. Um, so development, uh, it's pretty straightforward. Um, development is just adding new features to Koha. Um, that can be extending or enhancing existing features. Um, one of my favorite things that I like to call development is kind of solidifying some of the workarounds that libraries have used. There's a lot of things out there that libraries do in Koha that it was never really intended to do. Or sometimes you find a really clever thing, you're like, hey, we can use this to do to do this. We can make Koha do this when we when we kind of use this workaround. Um, one of our favorite developments is when we actually take those kind of workarounds that you've developed and turn them into an official Koha feature, because the problem that can happen when we don't do that is that someone will fix your bug, um, and suddenly a workflow that you've had for years is now broken because we fixed it. <laughs> We're very helpful like that. Developers. Um, so just an overview of kind of how how Koha, the development process, works for the community. Um, the community uses Bugzilla for everything. So whenever you bring an enhancement to us or a new feature that you want to work on, we're going to start referring to it as a bug. We're going to talk about everything as a bug. It doesn't mean it's a problem. It's just kind of how we keep track of things as Koha developers. Um, Bugzilla is the, is the software that we use, and every issue on Bugzilla is a bug. Um, within that, we can list them as new features, enhancements, or whatever. Um, if it's a bug, it's likely to be something that you'll see get backported into your existing version of Koha. If it's an enhancement or a new feature, you're going to have to wait a little while. Um, so the community process starts with submission. Now, uh, calling out a developer during your presentation is one way to get them notified about something. <laughs> but a better idea is to submit it to Bugzilla. Um, that's where you write it up. You just say kind of, hey, Koha, it wouldn't be great if Koha did this. We'd love it if Koha did this. I um, mean, anyone is free to go out there and submit those ideas and put them on to Bugzilla um, and say they want them. Um, when they're submitted to, to the Bugzilla, they start out in the new status. Um, the second part is getting them assigned. Um, that's what Bob and Wally are going to talk a little bit more about. That's when you actually have a developer who is committed to working on this. Now, don't get too excited if you see something is assigned in the community. That doesn't necessarily mean someone is actively working on it or being paid to work on it. Sometimes it just means I'd like to work on it. There's lots of things we'd all like to do. Uh, we won't necessarily get to it. So funding those developments and securing the assignment is important. Um, once a developer has taken it on and written code, the bug will go to need sign off. Um, need sign off is the first step in our QA process to make sure that the bugs that we're doing are, are good for Koha. Um, and so essentially at the need sign off stage, that's where it's presented to users to come along. Somebody needs to come along and test it. 
Um, it's a test plan written by a developer, so it means it's always going to be super clear and detailed. <laughs> no, <laughs> that wasn't a joke. <laughs> um, need sign up. We just need you to test it, and you really just have to test that it does what the developer said it's going to do. Um, that's as far as that needs to go. So anyone can sign off. There is no pressure. If you sign off on something and QA comes along later and says, this isn't a good bug, that's not your fault. It's OK. <laughs> um, so the next day, just signed off. Signed off is where it's going to wait for that QA person in the community to come along and actually review whether, one, is it good code? Um, is it code that follows the community standards? Does it work how it says it to? Two, does it not break what's happening in Koha, uh, which is a very important thing for us is to not break it or not change existing behavior unless we think that behavior is a bug, going back to what I said earlier. <laughs> um, once it, the QA member has said, yay, that's great code, it gets past QA. At past QA, it waits for a final review from the release manager, which is usually a pretty simple review. They'll kind of just bring up procedural problems that they find or test failures or things like that. Rarely do they reject them out of hand. Um, and then it gets pushed to master. And that's the life cycle of a bug. Yeah. Hey, oh, uh, there are other things that, and it's likely, uh, a lot of times with your developments, you'll see them go to failed QA. That means that the QA person in the community has said there's more work to be done here, um, that there's a problem, that there's something that we need to change um, or just to fix the code. Sometimes it can be simple as simple as you need to clean this up, it's hard to read. Uh, it can be as difficult as this doesn't work at all and it breaks everything that I do in Koha. Yikes. Um, there's another status you might see in discussion. Uh, developers complain about this status. I'm going to be clear about that. Um, but Jay-Z and Kelly yelled at me the last time because I told people not to put things into discussion. But in fact, you should feel free to put things into discussion. Uh, in discussion means that you have questions about how it works in Co-op, how it's going to affect your daily workload, what it's going to do. Um, in discussion, we dread as developers because it can be hard to get things out of discussion and to say the discussion is over. Um, a lot of times we will say that too early. Uh, because we want to get your code in because we're really excited about it. Um, but sometimes, too, from an in discussion, we need to rotate on an axis and find a new way to tag <laughs> Um And the last status I just wanted to mention, in case you see it out there in Bugs in the Land, is resolved duplicate. Uh, just because your bug will be resolved, and you'll say, yay, it's resolved, it's fixed. Uh, sometimes it's resolved as a duplicate of another bug that is way up higher back in the statuses. So just kind of an idea, that's that's the process that it goes through in the community um, without talking about any of the actual code or anything like that. Is in discussion anywhere before pushed to master? Can that show up at any time? It can it can show up at any time before push to master. Um, you can you can file a bug and immediately set it to in discussion if you want to. And if you see a bug that is past QA and you have a problem with it, set it to in discussion um, to, to kind of stop that process. Uh, in discussion is slightly different than failed QA. Failed QA is more of a, it doesn't work, and in discussion is more, there, there's questions about this. Um, will it, if you do put it in discussion, when it, when your questions have been answered, please move it out of in discussion. <laughs> um, so submitting a request for development. As I said before, you can submit it directly to the community. You can put it out there and hope that somebody is going to do it. Um, Better shot if you go to a vendor and you pay someone to do it just because you know that they're going to work on it. Um, how should you submit the development? Uh, the more information you give us when you submit a development, the easier it is for us to kind of plan it out and see what needs to be done. Um, when you're thinking of what you want to see, if you can actually show the developers what you want to see, it's a much better way for us to understand kind of what you need and how it's going. Um, one of the things we developers like to talk about is how interesting it is when we put a new feature into Koha and the, and the upgrades go through and people start using the feature. We love seeing how they use that feature and how they kind of interpret what we've put out there and the new workflows that they've developed out of this feature. Uh, the flip side of that is that if you put in a request for development to a bunch of developers, you should hear the wild ways that we try to implement it. <laughs> um, 
it's not always going to be the same. So it's just to make sure that you know kind of exactly what you want when you're putting that out there. And the more you give us, the, the clearer it will be. Um, if you just submit it as a bug, what's going to happen next? It all depends. I mean, sometimes developers will pick up things. And there is a lot, as I said before, there's a lot we'd like to do. There are so many bugs out there that I would love to just sit down and take care of and get out of the way. Uh, especially when you give a whole presentation around a bug that I owe you to finish. <laughs> um, but so just remember, you know, the community is a community and we will help you out. If you are willing, if you're out there working on bugs and signing off things, there's a much better chance that someone's going to come along and be like, hey, I will pick up that bug for you. Um, so it can work that way. And it's great. Uh, this is just where I wanted to talk about this was going to be a placeholder. How does my water take a request and turn into a spec and, and a process bug in community? Uh, that's in flux right now. Um, it kind of takes into account all that last stuff I was saying on the slide. Um, when a development comes into us, we don't want to just take it and do it straight ahead. Uh, we have done that in the past, and that's how sometimes we end up with things that weren't what the library wanted um, and weren't what the community wanted. Um, and both of those can be bad because if it's not what the library wants, that's going to require more development. If it's not what the community wants, it may not get into Koha. Um, so we really try these days to review not only like what is the request that you've put in, but how is it going to impact other libraries? Um, during the discussion before, somebody talked about the uh, how Koha has become more consortium friendly. That is one of the big things we try to take into consideration when we're working on new bugs that are coming in is not only how does it affect this library, but how will it affect libraries in a system um, and kind of considering those things. So we're still really working on our process of how to do that, but we do try to involve everybody. Um, but what I will put out there for you as well is when you're coming up with your bug ideas, involve the community as well and see if you can get other ideas about how other libraries will work. You know, there's a difference between a library ordering 20 items and a library ordering four pallets of boxes all at once. Oh. <laughs> all right. So if anybody remembers the TV show Lost, a common refrain was live together, die alone. I don't, now that it's like been about 15 years since an episode aired, I can spoil that many, many characters died. <laughs> and hopefully, uh, in our situation, fatalities will be limited. <laughs> but what I wanted to do is uh, talk a little bit about uh, this from the perspective of kind of like, you know, you've got Nick who has very, who actually writes code. I do not write code, but I've been involved with development, both for my consortium, but also with the, uh, uh, with Koha US. Uh, one of the duties that I didn't remember until Christopher reminded me as vice president was you have to chair the development committee. So uh, I got really acquainted with a few things uh, pretty quickly there, but I, I just want to encourage people that there are a lot of ways uh, in which to get involved. And if you don't have a level of comfort, uh, there is a pretty, there's some low hanging fruit there to uh, get up to speed. So getting involved in those conversations, a lot of those are happening at the SIGs. So uh, like we, we have the acquisition, all, all those conversations are, uh, are mostly happening there uh, in the, in the worldwide community. A lot I would probably say there's probably more happening in that SIG than uh, probably anywhere else. So uh, that, that's a great place and we have a variety of SIGs with uh, Koha US. That would be a special interest group, I should say. Uh, so there are also the serves and Slack channels and things like that. So you will find uh, discussions there. You can post an idea for uh, something like you don't have to write up uh, a full spec and hand it over to a, de a development company. You can just say, hey, what do other people think of this idea? And uh, you can follow up with that with, with Slack. You can actually talk to a, a real live developer on Slack even. Uh, that Those opportunities do exist. So uh, that's another thing you can do. 
Uh, I, I don't typically do this a lot, but I know a lot of people that do just monitor Bugzilla. There's some easy ways to see what new bugs are coming in. Some of them may not apply to you. Some of them may be confusing to you, but you may see something that you're like, that's a really good idea. This is something I want to get involved with. And then it's with an account, it's very easy to just add your name to the CC list. That way, anytime that bug gets updated, you with a comment or something happening on it, you get an email and you get notified on that. Uh, so that's another thing. Just having conversations with vendors is another uh, opportunity. Um, and there are some options. I'll talk a little bit more uh, later. The devs.bywatersolutions.com page. I've got a screenshot of that I'll show later as well. But there are a lot of um, there are a lot of development ideas that are already up there. Some of which have uh, had some commitment, at least partially, uh, funding. So, uh, so that's a great place to look. And then I will get to the new uh, Koha development process. So, um, yes, that was a recent addition to the uh, to, to the uh, slide. Um, so. What we looked at with our old process, which we I think we felt was a little too onerous for people, was to be like, hey, submit a, a full spec to Koha US. Also, go find a quote from a vendor. That seemed like a, a lot of uh, work to put on to individual people, and we weren't getting a lot of uh, a lot of options with that. So what we want to do instead of like having uh, people file their own bugs uh, and, and going that way is to uh, get on that devs page uh, that, uh, and I know the process for that is a little murky, uh, but you can talk to somebody at Bywater and I'm sure they can get it up there. And I and that goes for, if you're not supported, I don't think there's any reason why that wouldn't work either. That uh, Bywater is always, been more than happy to uh, work with unsupported libraries as well. So, uh, so that is kind of a, a good way to get things started, and it does start that generate that um, that that first discussion with a vendor because they might ask you questions like, "What do you mean by this?" So it kind of you know kind of crafts it into a, a way, and they can help you get something that actually is meaningful up there. Uh, once we have we there's quite a few on there, but the development committee will create a uh, list of things to vote from from that page. So we will decide that. And if you think that seems, oh, this is totally unfair that the development committee has all this power. Guess what? Anybody can attend our meetings. You can advocate for a particular, uh, for a particular bug. You can join the development committee. Nothing is stopping you to do that. So if you want to participate, please uh, join our meetings. We'd love to have you. Uh, eventually, once that's decided on, we'll put out a vote and uh, membership will have a say in what, uh, what gets decided on. So um, then it's on the development committee, even if it starts out at that Bywater page, the devs page, we will try to find uh, the vendor that's, uh, that's going to do it. And, with factors of how fast it's going to take, cost, things like that. So uh, we can also see if there's other interested libraries in contributing funds to that, because uh, the less money Koha U US spends, the more often we can we can uh, sponsor development. So there's no timeline that we have written in. We don't do this necessarily just once a year. It's all kind of dependent on how much funds we have, what we're committed to in that process. So we can we can do a new vote uh, periodically, depending on how those are going. So just to show you what the devs page looks like, uh, this is just a screenshot of part of it that there's only three showing on this, but it continues down. There's lots of options there. Uh, it's, I always like looking at it just to see what ideas people are thinking of. And if you have any uh, money budgeted for development and you don't want to spend it all in one shot, this might be a good way to kind of pick and choose a few things you could contribute to that will uh, get some of these great ideas going. 
And then uh, working with international vendors, Nick, who is one of your three options for development. <laughs> with these others, uh, Nick personally. No, uh, he, uh, <laughs> Bywater, you know, is a is a growing concern. There's a lot of developments uh, in the works, and you can't always just say, "Hey, I would love to do this, and I have money," and then it just happens smoothly. So, uh, like Nick said, there's a process they have to undergo, and then they have to fit that in with all their other uh, developments they have planned. So it may not be a super quick uh, way to do that. So you can definitely look at other vendors and Koha US has done that and my consortium has done that. So what I would say is it's really important to work with the vendor from the community. We tried a little experiment as an organization where we went outside the community. And was that fun, Christopher? Did you enjoy that process? Yay. <laughs> um, that that code, they they that was a great example of somebody writing code that technically worked. It did what we had asked, but it did not pass QA because the code was not up to community standards. And then we ended up working with Catalyst to clean it up a little bit and make it so it actually got into uh so it got pushed to master. So uh that so we learned something from that. I think it was a good idea to try that. But we learned that uh, having somebody familiar with the community and what those standards are is really important to that angle of actually getting it passed through the community and into a release. So that's really important. So there are some options. Uh, we have worked and are working currently with um, with, with Catalyst from New Zealand. Um, I know for me, uh, for my consortium, we have we've also worked a little bit with Catalyst. And what I will say is I was perhaps a little naive about uh, how fast things would be pushed through the community by going with an international vendor. So I just want to make you aware of that because it has to um, you know, like it's great to see all of a sudden, like, wow, within a few weeks. You know, there's something to look at, codes being written, this is awesome, but that still has to go through the community process. And because Catalyst is not our support vendor, it's not so easy for us to just uh, put their uh, their work on our, our, our test server. So we would have to have a different setup to be able to do that. So that uh, we can definitely spin up uh, a test server and sign off and look at it and all that, and that's great. But it's not like we can just force the, their work into our current version any faster. So it still has to get pushed to uh, to a, a master and then released. And because if you're a Bywater customer, you're six months behind the very current release, you have to factor that in too. So just a word of caution there, there's nothing wrong with going this route. It just does take some time to get there. It's uh, it may be faster than uh, going with Bywater. It may not. It kind of depends, uh, but it still does take some time. So we haven't yet had an opportunity to work with PTFS Europe, but I think at some point we would like to go through that experience with them. I know for my consortium, we've looked at a couple of things and we just haven't had quite the right fit yet uh, to work on those. So I'm going to hand this over to Wally so he can speak from his experiences. So first off, um, before I go in, the paparazzi has not come in to see me yet. So my director has asked that somebody take a picture of me standing up here so that um, I can prove, I guess, that I was here. Um, you know, that I didn't take a tour of the leaves falling and everything up in Vermont. But anyway, Very well. so, <laughs> so I am truly just an average user. I'm my background is in uh, college administration, and then 20 years as a special ed teacher. I've retired from that, and now uh, then we opened our new little library that started out in a room about this size, and then moved into our own facility in 2018. Uh, about yeah. probably 100. Well, anyway, we uh, we went. Uh, from nothing to an awful lot. I started out as a six hour a week um, person 
um, was computer savvy enough that I, they trusted me <laughs> on their systems. And then we moved, uh, we wanted to move away from our, we outgrew our previous ILS and went on the search for a new ILS. And we landed with Koha, have been extremely happy with it. The idea of open source was a little bit um, daunting from the standpoint that a canned product sometimes is easy because you just push a button and it goes and does what it's supposed to. But we needed it to do more. And so Koha answered that. And Lucas, and Nick, and others in the group have saved my uh, that side, um, quite a bit. That said, though, this farm, I'm from Texas, this farm boy, though, from South Carolina is not, was told never to go get in the weeds of things. You needed to be in the field where it's weedless. So I'm still an average um, user. My issue with development is that 90% of what they talked about is like Japanese. <laughs> and so looking at Bugzilla, looking at going through listservs, et cetera, I'm also uh, wear many hats at my library. I sit at a reference desk. I sit at the adult upstairs desk. So in the middle of me trying to figure out something or whatever in Koha, hi, can you tell me where this book is? Sure, get up and go and come back. The issue is that I don't, we don't have the resources to get into the weeds as much as we know what we want, but we don't know how to get it. And so I wanted to tell you a little bit about one of the things that we're trying to do within our library to make it a little bit more doable from, from our perspective. Um, okay, so let me go on to the next step. This button. <laughs> so how can libraries, small, uh, especially a smaller one, impact development? Each year we hear, thanks to so-and-so at -so, these conferences, thanks to XYZ library system, we are going to push down this new development. Or uh, Koha US is the force behind this particular development. That's great. And a lot of times it's these big consortiums with these big budgets or bigger budget than what we have. Um, so what can an average library do? What can any little library do that can help with this? The idea of crowdfunding that uh, Valerie brought up earlier um, is what we have been focusing on at our library. We don't have a big budget. We, I mean, we have, I think our entire collections budget is somewhere in the neighborhood of 38,000, something to that effect. Um, so to put towards anything else, we either have to go and rob uh, Peter to pay Paul or something to that effect. So we came up with an idea to try to figure out how we can budget in for development. The issue with that was that if you put in a line item budget, most of the time they want to make sure you spend that, that budget. Well, what if we come up with a development, or what if we don't come up with a development for that year? How are we going to say, well, we just didn't need to spend it this year. It doesn't carry over to the next year, so why do you need this money again? We were able to um, take this and, yes, um, we were able to add and got it approved through our budgeting system to do a line item that we are putting in as um, as a professional service, discretionary and recurring for $1,500. That was something that was doable from our budgetary standpoint. We hope to increase that at some point, but at this stage of the game, it's just $1,500. The idea behind that is one of the developments that we are interested in is about a $20,000 development. My thinking was, okay, if I can end up with, you know, 10 or 20, that can significantly help us figure that out and, and sponsor that development. The issue then became, how are we going to uh, get people on board with that? How are we going to do this crowdfunding? 
First off, we had to prove to our people, our budget people, that it was worthwhile for us to do this. So we wrote this out, and I'm not going to read this all out to you. It'll be on the slides and whatever else. It'll be on the uh, summary for the conference. So I'm not going to read this to you. But basically, we had to tell them what the purpose of the request was. We had to describe the various benefits. And we needed to, and I know I went fast through that, but y'all can read it later, okay? <laughs> I know we have libraries with speed reading capabilities in here, but I'm not testing that today. <clears throat> and then what are the revenue enhancements? Because you know, anywhere that's dealing with the bean counters want to know how is this going to help the bottom line? So what we need to do now is we the groundwork with COHA US is being laid um, to uh, make sure that we can get our development ideas in in a more usable, user-friendly way. Like I said, I wear multiple hats. I don't have the, the luxury of being in my own little computer room watching things, watching bugs go by on the screen and <laughs> the controller, you know, whatever. Um, or the, you know, as a, as a screensaver or something, but, <laughs> but, um, it's something though, that I want to say that we need to have the, the, the communication and the budget planning. And I think the development page that Koha US is doing, is going to be a big help with that. The commitment's got to be though, from you all that you're going to at least spend some time going and checking out the development page, not the 11,000 or 34,000 some odd bugs that we have now, and figuring out what you need to do. You need to look and see what is out there and whether it's something that you want to sponsor or help sponsor. If you can get the budgets for it, if you can put something in and contribute $100 towards a, a development, guess what? It's going to move fast. Not necessarily through the Q&A part. <laughs> or Q, whatever, yeah, um, and all that sort of stuff. I told you, I don't like weeds, but, but um, I'm not going into that. <laughs> but the average user needs to be able to figure out a way to get in and get development that works for their library. What may work for a consortium isn't going to work necessarily for our little, little library. What works for our little library and the workflow for our library isn't going to work for a consortium. So um, we don't have all the answers yet, but if libraries do their part to prepare for their needs, and I'm again talking the budgetary thing, so that you can contribute, go into the bugs and look and say, I'm going to throw $100. My library is going to throw $100 into this. We can make it happen um, because it should get traction and can then move forward. What are your thoughts on development? Are y'all as confused by development as I am? <laughs> um, what do you think your needs are? How are you gonna make the playing field a little more level? Um, what are the methods that would work in your library's world to make development more user-friendly? I think Bob would probably be the one that would uh, welcome that sort of feedback. Because again, I think Ohio US is trying very hard to make sure that um, we answer, we are an open source and we are one. So otherwise, we'll buy alone. <laughs> so uh, anyway, that's basically my part of, of this. Thank you for being here. Um, what kind of questions or anything that you have? Yeah, we, we can play a game where you ask development questions. I take a stab and then Nick says the actual answer. <laughs> I like that. No, uh, I did want to say that uh, to Wally's uh, point about that stuff, it's not just Koha US, the community broader than that. Like I, you know, I am more than happy. I know I worked with, uh, we haven't completed that process, but Clams and I had a discussion about uh, about a particular thing we wanted. I've written up a spec and we've kind of looked at it. There's some similar bugs that so we're still doing that. So other members of the community, if you if you're daunted by how do I write up a spec, you can get advice, you can get help. There's lots of opportunities to kind of shepherd this process to uh, to where you want it to go. But yeah, what questions do you have? I just wanted to oh, throw yeah. in there. Um, so 
Bob, Bob mentioned some difficulties with working with outside vendors. Um, and I just wanted to touch on that. The, the Koha community is very open to having more people working on Koha. Like it's what we want. In fact, we love having a bigger community. Um, but one of the things about that community process is that it doesn't fit the standard software development models. Yeah. Um, that's that's part of why we're continually working on our process of how we handle developments and how we do them. Because um, we know that we need to take into account that kind of community, the QA, and we want to do that in a way that when we start a development, it's going to go through in the fastest way possible. And, and we kind of plan ahead for that QA. Um, it's hard sometimes to communicate that reality to an outside vendor who is new to the community. Um, but if if there are people out there, other I, I'm sure there's a lot of other software vendors listening to this right now, but I just wanted to throw that out that the community is always happy to have more developers, um, whether they're at libraries or whether they're at another company um, to bring them in. It's just recognizing that we were in a slightly different model, which I think works largely. Yeah, and I think uh, expectation setting was maybe one of our issues. We revised our process a little bit where we have something we actually uh, more of a contract type thing that we uh, put out there so that there it is understood that if there is QA uh, things that come up that that the, that the organization that agrees to work on the uh, development is responsible for helping get it all the way through the community, not just doing a first stab at code and then dropping it on us and saying adios where's the paycheck so uh so yeah are we are we ready for questions yes. Yes. there's microphones people are eager to hand them to you and i i will say i, I want to throw in there that uh, um so we we have learned some lessons and I'm, I'm very happy with what we've learned the, the process was hard but we have learned some good lessons in that and i feel like we're more prepared for those developments in the future. That being said, you know, if, if you are on 2211, you are probably seeing the fruits of one of our developments that we worked hard on, uh, which was uh, customizing account lines and uh, descriptions, which was really important. And, you know, we, we've had people uh, working on that for years. And so we were glad to see that go through. And then, uh, uh, we had one coming out in 2305 for uh, message deletion in the OPAC. You know, so when you do a, send a message to a patron, you know, it just sticks there until somebody on the staff side deletes it. And now the patron can say, okay, I wrote it. And then we can see that they've read it. And we can remove that on our side if we want to or whatever. So that's great. And when is 2305? When are we expecting that out? We'll, we'll be starting running minutes here soon, I think, at the end of fall. In the fall, okay. So, so you can look forward to that. But, uh, you know, that, that has been something that I'm really happy that uh, Koha US has been able to work together to uh, contribute to in the community. And we're currently working on uh, something that is relevant to uh, another presentation with the, uh, the, that, getting in, increasing that batch number that you can do with the self checkout so that is the current development that we're working with catalyst on so uh so if anybody was worried about that limit uh someday sometime we will have <laughs> something in there that will allow for uh an increase in the amount of uh items you can check out through the self-checkout with the QR code or with the, uh, no, RFID. <laughs> I got QR on the line. Yeah. RFID. Yeah. <laughs> there is a brief online comment from Heather Hernandez. Um, earlier in this discussion, uh, you guys mentioned uh, Slack and communication. Heather also wanted to say the IRC is also an option. Uh, that's open source doesn't require any special software and there is a Koha IRC channel I can't think of the top of my head I don't remember the name of it it's like is it just hashtag Koha so it's pretty simple <laughs> um last year at Koha US uh Jay-Z Kelly and I did a presentation about getting involved in the community and if you go back and watch that one it covers IRC and Bugzilla in a lot more detail than I did at the beginning of my presentation Um, Nick, at the beginning, you had mentioned that 
um, we can help test things? How does that work? Um, so either either using the sandboxes, um, which are basically little Kohas that you go and you put in the bug number and it spins up a new Koha instance with that bug number in there. That's sort of the lowest bar entry point. That's how I got started working on Koha. I started signing off on bugs um, until I got a little deeper into it. Um, so that's a good place to start is just testing things there. You can't test everything on a sandbox. So kind of the next level up from that is installing your own Koha and testing it, which is actually very easy. I promise. Um, but the other way is if you have something that you want to test, you can reach out to your support vendor and ask um, either to try and get a demo or some help signing it off. And we're usually, we're happy to help with things like that. Okay. Yeah. And, and I believe there's numerous presentations either through this conference or other conferences that can be found. Uh, I know like if you just search on the Bywater page, you should be able to find some instructions for how to spin up a server and uh, apply a bug and all that. Yeah. So uh, if you can get details, so well, resources are out there. They were oh. Hi, um, Laura from Middlesex. Um, I was just wondering what your experience in, in terms of the number of libraries who actually do spend money aside for development. Um, I mean, I thought it was a good idea, but I know, like, if I could go back and say, everybody's doing this, if I need something more than what I need. Yeah, I mean, Nick, this is me going to take a stab, and then Nick gives this as an example of that. But I would say there's, uh, Bywater is growing so fast, I would say that's changing. Uh, that there's so many more people entering Koha, and in some cases, it's larger consortia. And they are definitely interested in development and have uh, funds for that. So uh, I think I think that it's I feel like there's more of a critical mass towards developments getting uh, funded than maybe there was uh, when we uh, joined the community uh, in 2019. And, and I would just say, comment to that too and say that that we it's coming out of necessity. If you want to, you know, as open source, yeah, we can get our ideas to, you know, fix a little something here and a little something there, or how you work around something. But if you want something truly in, in enhanced, if you want a new feature or something, we've got to develop it to do do so. And the money has to come from somewhere. It's not, I mean, Nick, that last thing I heard, he's not working for free. So, um, you know, so... There's, there's, I think it's coming out of necessity. I know that is why what we have come up with, with our little beginning budget to start with so that we can tag on with other libraries and say that, that want to have a similar outcome and say, we value this. We're going to join X library and try to get this going. Um, so I think it's out of necessity. And the other question I had was, when I look at Bozilla um, and looking at the statuses, I see lots of things that I go, hey, this would be really cool, and it's not even assigned. So it sits there sometimes for years not being assigned. So I'm just wondering, you know, are we sort of saying to people, oh, go suggest without really giving them a clear understanding that it, there's a, there are additional steps that need to be taken in order to really make this happen? I mean, yeah, I, I think I tried to hint on that at the beginning. Yeah, I mean, putting the bug out there in Bugzilla is a great way to at least get your idea out there. Um, but it, that's the point at which I think you need to kind of work on that, getting support, and then finding someone to do it. Um, you know, if there if there is a, a lot of support in the community, it's something that everybody wants. Um, what's that? Get involved with the SIGs. The SIGs are, are good ways to kind of organize that and get that. Um, the community... Various people in the community will take up developments if there is a lot of interest occasionally. But again, uh, while I wish that I could do every development that's out there, it's a matter of, it's a matter of time and a little bit of money. Um, so yeah, putting your idea out there though doesn't hurt because that's when you can get enough libraries involved and you can get that kind of clear spec and build to, hey, we just need this. Um, and sometimes 
what's interesting is that you'll find, you'll put it out there and then someone else will develop it in a different way or they'll say, hey, have you tried doing this? And you can kind of find it out from the workflow. So that's where working with the SIGs and Koha US is actually really helpful too, is you might, sometimes you'll put an idea out there and it will turn out, well, you actually can do that. Yeah, that, that, that is true. The other thing I would say is if you comment on that bug and follow it, you're, you're kind of putting out an advertisement to others that might be interested that, like, you know, if, if they come and like, oh, this person wanted it. So, and you, you, there's no reason you can't contact somebody that also comments on it and say, hey, can we talk about this? Maybe we can put some money together and see how to figure out how to do it. It's all about just having those conversations and coming up with a plan and collaborating on those ideas uh, to make it work. So, but yeah, I think... It's, it is rare that stuff just happens. You have a great idea, you, you suggest it, and it just happens. Because there's a number of those bugs that I'm uh, following that uh, have been like, oh, that's such a great idea. One being mentioned earlier, that closing the library thing. There's a lot of like, yeah, we should totally do this. But until we actually probably come together and come up with a budget with all those libraries that are interested, it, you know, it may not move forward. Um, I will say that um, putting putting the bug out there is, you know, obviously the first step. But anytime I put a bug out there and I think it's worthwhile and I think other people might be interested in it, I'll mention it on Slack or I'll mention it at, at, at COPA uh, general meeting. Um, getting people interested starts with making them aware because just because the bug is out there doesn't mean they're aware of it. So. If you wanted to get noticed, talk about it and advocate for it and uh, build up a case for it because you know if people don't understand it and they don't know why they would want this, if they if, you know they just read the bug and it doesn't make sense to them, then they may not jump on board. But you know, generating that interest is important. It doesn't it doesn't guarantee that 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 bug will move forward, but it does tell the community and the developers enough people are interested in it, maybe some funding is uh, something that needs to be looked into next. And so, I will say, as far as our general meeting goes, if you haven't been in a while, we do a lot of talk about bugs. It's a great uh, chance to do that. So uh, I'll, Bob mentioned that he hasn't heard of any success stories. I've got a success story. So there was, I don't even remember what the development was. I, I said uh, in an email, I, I put the bug into Bugzilla, and then I asked Bywater if they could come up with, you know, I said, this is what I want to do. Here's the bug that I created. How much would it cost to do this? And then Joyce sent me back an email saying it's going to be like, you know, $2,000 something like that. It was a pretty minor thing and then I said okay I'll talk to my boss about this and see if we can come up with that money and maybe I'll ask some of the other people in the Kansas group and uh, then for some reason or another um, my boss was on vacation or something I don't remember but I just kind of let it slip by and the next time I looked at it like three weeks later um, somebody else asked about the same issue and uh, Bywater said well this is the spec that we're working on with George and two other people funded it, didn't cost me the other. <laughs> so it was pretty, I was really pleased with that. <laughs> so I'm Cab from Plasto here in New Hampshire. Um, and this is coming from a smaller library. And I know every time a new release comes out, for, for us at least, it's a little bit like Christmas because I'm never really sure what's <laughs> what's coming and what you know the developers have been working on. Is there a way to sort of have a sense of okay, we have Goha dot whatever, and it's coming in six months, and this is likely what's going to be in there. Well, I, there are release notes, and I will say they could be the the ones from the community are pretty burly, and so <laughs> I, I would you know unless you really want to get your head into a different place, and if you're not familiar with all the language, that could be tough. But one of the best ways is. The Monday Minutes does uh, previews a lot of stuff that's coming, so that's a good way to uh, look for that because not only do you have them talk about it, but they will they will actually show you what it's going to look I'm like. About months, months, months. months yeah, because the release notes are all right around release time, right? 
So Bywater will put together their release notes, will be which will be cribbed from the other release notes, and that'll be a little bit pared down. But there are for the most current version, you can find release notes. And like I said, there's there's going to be a lot of stuff because there's a lot of little bug fixes and a lot of things like that. But if you stick to looking at like the new features, you can get a sense of what's what's coming, even if the language may be sometimes a little unclear to me. By water, I mean, by water plants are usually six months behind too. Yep. So if you look at the release notes for the newest version, right. Right, six months from that, so yep. you'll see it. One thing I just want to add on the Bugzilla on um, what Christopher said was the biggest problem from a larger library that does have a dedicated budget, staff will can come to me with a problem but not have a solution. And it's hard for me to come up with a solution to everybody's problem. But I will often find that somebody on Bugzilla has the same problem and potentially has a proposed solution, which does a lot of work for us. So I do think there is value, even if you can't fund it, in putting your information. To, first of all, knowing that somebody else has a problem, it's just comforting for people. And second of all, especially if you have a thought process behind it, that can save a lot of work for somebody who is funding or who has funding. And, and then you can just say, oh, yeah, this. I like the way this person thought about what's let's do at that point. Discussion. In discussion. <laughs> so uh, I talked at uh, some conference in the past about this about one of the things I do. There is, if you go to Bugzilla at the bottom of the page, there is a there are links for bugs reported in the last 24 hours and bugs reported in the last seven days. And underneath that, there's a bugs changed in the last 24 hours. And bugs change in the last seven days. And that's kind of what I try to do is once a week. And I haven't done this in a while, I've got any plan, but uh, if you go there once a week and look at bugs change in the last seven days, that kind of tells you because bugs change in the last seven days is going to have the new stuff, it's going to have the stuff that's been signed off, it's going to have the stuff that's passed QA, pushed to master, and failed QA. All of those things are going to be in bugs uh, changed in the last seven days. And so what I try and do once a week is go there and just look through and, and look at the titles of those things. And if I look at it and it says, you know, um, change DB, you know, if, if, it, if it has anything to do with the database or you know, acquisitions, things that we don't use in our library or things that I don't understand, I'll just skip those and I'll go down and I'll find something until I find something that makes sense to me and then I'll read it. And I'll go, okay, well, that's interesting. Um, this is a good idea. Um, I'm going to add myself to the CC list on it, and that way I can track of it. And it, it's just a way of kind of knowing what the developers are doing and how co is progressing from week to week. Um, so that's an easy thing for people to do. And even though you're not giving input back, maybe when you start doing it, maybe you're just reading it, that, just reading it and being aware of what's going on. That's participation right there. So I encourage everybody to do that, even if you don't understand it. If you, if you read it every week, eventually something will pop up that you actually don't understand. <laughs> and if you go through a couple of weeks and you see a couple of things that you understand, maybe that's time you can look at it and you can say, hey, I understand what's going on here. This is a terrible idea. I'm going to make a comment that says, boy, this is a terrible idea. For me, you'll say, wow, this is a brilliant idea. And you'll just, and you can just say, wow, this is a great idea. Plus one is, is the, the short link saying, great idea. Let's keep doing this. So, um, so that's just what I wanted to say there. Another thing that I would say that is a good idea for getting bugs looked at and getting them worked on is come to a conference, do a presentation, and in your presentation say, these are the bugs that people should be paying attention to. <laughs> And so expect to see that tomorrow, maybe that Christopher and I do the podcast. These are the bugs that kids should be focused on. Yeah. yeah, and I was going to say too, we need to be cheerleaders. I mean, if you see something, that, go check the lists out. And when you see something that's yours, be a cheerleader and round up your friends. Round up your friends that you've met here at the conference and that you have uh, on Slack or wherever, and say, "This is beginning to gain traction. We need. I need you to." Put in a comment about it so it goes further. That's very, very important. What are the red ones mean on Bugzilla? Like this little... Those are, I think, either critical or major. 
um, they get they turn red when they're that way. And you'll see that the uh, if it's all in black, so it looks more bold, that's a bug. And then the gray tend to be the new features and the enhancements. Um, so we kind of try to make, I don't know what I'm pointing at. We try to make <laughs> all of that out there. Um, but just, you know, just to say too, uh, developers are, are humans um, and we are, <laughs> tend to be very simple humans. And this is <laughs> um, if, if you go out there and sign off on some of our bugs and you move some other things along and then you come along with a very small request, those are scenarios where we might be like, oh yeah, we can do that for you right now. Um, <laughs> if it's an easy one. <laughs> but like help helping us out with, you know, helps move things forward and makes us happy and happy developers get more done. <laughs> I also just want to add on that if you see a bug that you don't totally understand, but you think it might be relevant, asking questions is also super useful. Um, you might be saving it from like getting stuck later down the road after they built the thing and it doesn't do a thing that it should. You just say, hey, would this do X, Y, Z? Maybe the answer is yes. Maybe the answer is no, but it should. So let's do that now instead of getting stuck here. And just, you know, draws more attention to it. <laughs> I will say Katrina is very, very uh, astute about correcting my bugs. That it goes, you know, maybe I'm not saying it quite right, or maybe it, it doesn't mean what I think it means to other people, especially in different countries. So she she likes to fix or address things up so that it is more relevant to people. So uh, don't I, I try not to let some things get under my skin about what, am I doing this wrong? What the heck? And it's like no, it, it it needs to be reshaped a little bit so it it fits the community better. And it, it is it is important to keep in mind that it is an inter international community. Um, so there are language barriers. Uh, so take everything as if it's meant in the best light, because it probably is. Um, we all want to move Koha forward. We all want to make it work. So when people comment things or change things, it's not, they're not trying to hurt your feelings. They're trying to help. Yes. Um, that's what I tell myself every time a bug fails to do it. <laughs> Heather has a lot of comments about this. <laughs> Heather, Heather says everyone on Bugzilla is really nice and helpful too. And she also says developer developers are magical humans. Got her stones. Any other questions? All right. Thank you very much.